Ladies and gentlemen, the secret word tonight is car. C-A-R. Really? You bet your life! It's Groucho Marx in You Bet Your Life, a comedy quiz series produced and transcribed from Hollywood and brought to you by the more than 3,000 DeSoto Plymouth dealers, the dealers who now have on display the outstanding 1954 DeSoto Automatic with fully automatic power flight transmission and the all-new 1954 Plymouth, your best buy in the low-priced field. And now, here he is, the one, the only... Well, here I am again with uh, $1,500 for one of our couples. Well, we invited some bridge teachers to the program, Groucho, and just before we went on the air, our studio audience selected Rose O'Brien Olson to be a contestant. Her partner is in the music business, Mr. Lucky Wilbur. So, folks, would you please come in and meet Groucho Marx? Welcome, welcome to your Betcha Life. Say the secret word and divide $100. It's a common word, something you see every day. Mrs. Rose O'Brien Olson, you're a bridge teacher, is that? Yes, I am, Archie. And where, where are you from, Rose? Tacoma, Washington. Uh-huh. Are you married? Yes, sir. Burned your bridges behind you, huh? Mm-hmm. Let's see. Your name is Lucky Wilbur? Yes. Oh. How old are you, Lucky? I'm 63. What sort of work do you do, Mr. Wilbur? I'm uh, what they call a song plugger. A song plugger? Mm-hmm. Well, really, of course, I, I know what a song plugger is, but I'm sure some of our listeners out there have never heard of song plugging. Could you tell them what a song plugger is? Well, I uh... mean, uh... Without us being arrested up here? <laughs> uh, I work for a publisher, and when we get a brand new song, why, it's my job to go out and see how many plugs I can get on it. Mm-hmm. A plug means uh, disc jockey, orchestra leader, anyone in the entertainment field. By the number of plugs, why, if the song has got a chance at all, we hope it will become a hit. Would you get paid by the plug? Oh, no. <laughs> I know no. a jockey does. I thought perhaps you did, too. <laughs> no, not yet. A disc jockey, I mean. Oh, he gets uh, paid by the plug. <laughs> There's a joke in there, but it uh, isn't worth the investigating. <laughs> How long have you been doing this kind of work? I've here, been at if it. If you can uh, call it work. Well, actually, 44 years. 44 years? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What are some of the songs you've made famous? Well, I started on Let Me Call You Sweetheart. Uh, Meet so me did tonight. I, and got nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> Meet Me Tonight in Dreamland. I used to sing that. Three o'clock in the morning I sang in a that around Spanish midnight, town. Huh? <laughs> Three o'clock in the morning in a little Spanish town. Three o'clock in the morning in a little Spanish town? I never heard that. Is that oh. all one song? No, two songs. Oh. Two and songs? That's in Arizona, isn't it? <laughs> no. <laughs> wow. And then from there I went. You, you have to admire me. I certainly keep plugging away out there. <laughs> I'm not funny, but I'm certainly persistent. Well, Rose, let's talk about bridge. You say you're a bridge teacher? Yes, I am. And where teacher. is your school? At 611, the contract bridge studio, 611 South Ardmore. Uh-huh. Not Los Angeles. We've been there about t- over 20 years. Uh-huh. I have my own system uh, in playing bridge. I played a couple of times. You kick your opponent in the shins, and then when they bend over, you just look at their cards. <laughs> Well, how about cheating? Is, is there much cheating goes on among these card players in the oh, bridge clubs? Heavens no, Harpo. Um, I mean, Groucho. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. It's all right. You call me Harpo, and I'll talk about stud poker. <laughs> Lucky, let's get back to you. By the way, did you know I did an album for Decca Records last year? Yeah, I heard it. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't heard a laugh like that since <laughs> since Frankenstein was done by Boris Karloff. Well, I'd like to continue this conversation. <laughs> but the time has come to play your bet, your life. Now, we have questions here ranging from $10 to $100, and you must pick four of them. The higher the amount, the tougher the question. Is that clear? Yes, sir. You play bridge. I'm sure you're good with mathematics. All right, let's see how much money you can make. You selected sports. Mm-hmm. Now, you want to try a $10 question, a 50 or a 100 or... Just talk it over between you and come to some specific conclusion. Let's start with 50. $50, all right. A period in the game of polo will last seven and a half minutes. What is this period called? Chuck. Chuck. That's right, Chuck. You're on your way with $50. Now, you'll be much safer if you decide on an answer before calling out. 
Oh, yeah. 60. 60, all right. What does the rubber disc use in ice hockey called? Puck. Puck. That's right, Puck. We now have $110. Don't look so somber, Phantom, and this isn't our money. <laughs> but it's my arithmetic. Oh. oh. <laughs> uh, which one do you choose this time? Uh, go up. Ten. Seventy. Seventy, all right. And what sport is Eric Guerin famous? G-U-E-R-I-N. Jockey. Jockey is right. Horse racing. We now find the $180. Now, uh, what do you want for your last question? Eighty. Eighty. All right. Who is the winner of the decathlon in the last two Olympic Games? Talk it over. Uh, Mathis. Bob Mathis. Bob Mathias. Is absolutely right. <laughs> With $260. Thanks and good luck from the DeSoto Plymouth Thank dealers. You very we have some newlyweds for you, Groucho. Um, Bob and Shirley von Kuznick, would you uh, come in, please, and meet Groucho Marx? Welcome, youngsters, for the DeSoto Plymouth dealers. Say the secret word, and you'll take home an extra $100. It's a common word, something you see every day. Let's see, Shirley and Bob Van Kuznick, huh? Eh? You're newlyweds? Yes, we are. Mm-hmm. And Bob, where's your hometown? Oh, I'm from Cleveland, Ohio, on Lake Erie. Cle- and Shirley, where are you from? I was born in Madisonville in Cincinnati. What sort of work do you do, Bob? I'm a lather. You get paid for laughing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I um, put on uh, wire paper and that and a plasterboard in the inside of the houses. Oh, you're a plasterer, huh? <laughs> How old are you, uh, Bob? I'm 26. You're pretty young to be plastered, aren't you? <laughs> What's your age, uh, Shirley? 19. Are you a plasterer, too? Uh? No, I'm not. How long have you two been married, Bob? Oh, about uh, 10 months. Hmm. Oh. Shirley, is he anywhere near the, near the right uh, amount? Well, to be exact, it's about 8 months, 3 weeks, and 2 days. Oh. Bob, when was the first time you, you met uh, Shirley? I was in a... Um... Hot dog stand, Cincinnati, in 1951. In a hot dog stand? Yes. Mm-hmm. You mean it was just puppy love at first sight? Huh? <laughs> what was Romeo doing there besides getting mustard all over his necktie? Oh, he was on a 48-hour pass from the army. Oh, 48-hour pass? That's right. What uh, what all did you manage to do on that 48-hour pass? Uh, well, we went out to uh, Coney Island, went dancing. Cincinnati. In Cincinnati. Is there a Coney Island in Cincinnati? Oh, yes, uh-huh. And uh, went swimming, went on all the amusements, took in a couple of movies, went to a show and a party. <laughs> he must have been loaded with money, eh? It's always a mystery to me how a $50 a month GI can spend $300 on a weekend. <laughs> Shirley, was Bob Zami uh, close enough for him to see you regularly after that first date? He was at Fort Knox. He was at Fort Knox? Yes. Oh. <laughs> That's where that $300 a week came from. Right? <laughs> what were you doing at Fort Knox? Were you a gold brick? Um, I was an instructor there. I was teaching GIs while we fight in Korea, troop information education. Mm. How long after you met Romeo did you get engaged, Shirley? About six months. Mm. What happened after he proposed, Shirley? Did he go and ask his general for a better job? He went AWOL. <laughs> From who? You or the, the army? army. <laughs> you know, you could get into trouble going AWOL, Bob. How long were you over the hill? Oh, about a year and a half. A year and a half? A year and surprised a half. the army missed you. <laughs> that is, I'm surprised the firing squad missed you. <laughs> Where'd you go for such a long time? Well, um, I was uh, teaching in my lesson plan uh, that the survival for Western democracy was at stake in Korea, and somebody would always say, wasn't well, he practice what he preaches, and after a lesson was over, and so I just went to Korea. You went to Korea? How'd you do that? I just decided to go and went out to the West Coast on an airliner. And, well, and how'd you swing it? I didn't know you could just pick up and go to Korea. Well, uh, after I got out there, I uh, went up to Seattle there, and I saw the ship there, and I knew it was going to Korea from where the GIs were talking around there, and uh, 
So I went over to the naval barracks there where they were billeted, and early that morning there was an advance detail of cooks and bakers leaving, and so I put on a white mess jacket and an apron and went down to the dock that morning real early, and there was only about 15 of us, and luckily it was raining at the time because an officer there said, are these the men? He said, yeah, and he says, well, it's raining. You better get the men out of the rain, and so we went aboard, and I went forward and got lost with the crew. I got to Japan. Well, how far did you get before they finally caught up with you? Well, uh, uh, they never did catch me. Uh, I got right up to the front lines. Well, tell us about your experience as an AWOL soldier on the front lines. How did you get lined up with an outfit? Well, uh, the first outfit I came across was the British uh, Princess Pats, and I stayed with them for a while and uh, on some assaults there, and then I worked my way over to their flank to a, a South Korean infantry unit. And I stayed with them for about three weeks. Now, weren't you frightened? After all, you were more or less short-sighted at all the training the ordinary soldier gets before he goes into action. Were you scared? Well, I was scared. Uh, some lieutenant might tap me on the shoulder and say I was wanted at Fort Knox. <laughs> well, what finally happened? Did the Army ever find out what became of that wandering boy? Well, uh, I finally uh, told the platoon sergeant about it. And what did he say? Well, uh, he told the lieutenant about it then. Then, yeah. what did the lieutenant do? Well, they went to captain, and the captain on up to uh, the colonel, the colonel to I-Corps. They were passing the buck private, in other words. <laughs> <laughs> well, what happened then? Well, I went to uh, Far East Command in Tokyo, and then from there to the Pentagon in Washington. Well, it certainly can get lost there. Huh? <laughs> what happened when it got to the Pentagon? Well, uh... Did they shoot you or anything? Hang you? They uh, finally court-martialed me and, and fined me $10. <laughs> well, you can get that hair if the exhaust in your car is smoking. Right? <laughs> Find you ten dollars, huh? Now, after you gave yourself up, how did they ship you? Did they ship you home right away? Well, after my court martial at Tokyo, uh, I requested uh, to be sent back to my adopted tank unit in Korea, and so my request was granted. And next morning, I was shipped back to Korea. I served mm -hmm. a full tour then with that unit. Well, that's an incredible story, Bob. A man assigned to Fort Knox wants to get something easier. Imagine a guy hanging around Fort Knox and dying to get to Korea and get into action. <laughs> Shirley, you've probably heard the story a thousand times. Did he leave out anything important? Well, he was wounded and decorated a couple times. And uh, there was a platoon up on the hill which needed some ammunition. They needed a volunteer to drive through uh, the front to bring them the ammunition. And so Bob volunteered to go up there, and he got through all the all the enemies and everything, although he was wounded. Were you dressed as a cook this time? Uh, <laughs> well, put her there, huh? Thank you. Uh, huh? I think this country is pretty safe with fellows like you hanging around. <laughs> now, Shirley, how soon after Bob got home did you get married? Did you wait until he closed the front door? <laughs> Or did you get married immediately? Well, it wasn't immediately. We got married that evening. Oh, well. <laughs> I'm glad you waited a reasonable length of time. <laughs> you said you took a chance waiting a whole day. You might have got a telegram from Patagonia saying, having a nice war down here. <laughs> I'll be late for the wedding. Signed, Bob. Well, now let's see if you two can win a lot of money. I, I have to be impartial up here. You realize that. I'm not allowed to say what I'm really thinking, but if you don't win the equivalent of Fort Knox, there's going to be some heads rolling in the morning. <laughs> in the race for the $1,500, the bridge teacher and the song plugger won $260, and the secret word is car. Now, let's see how much money you can make. You selected American history. Uh, you know how to play the, this game? Oh, um... I, have to, I have ten questions. I weigh 10, 20, 30, all the way up to 100. You must pick four of the ten. As they increase in value, they get correspondingly tougher. Is that clear? Clear. Now, which one do you want to start with? We'll start with the fifth question. Fifth question, $50. The first and most prominent signature among the names on the Declaration of Independence has become a symbol for all signatures. Whose name is it? John Hancock. That's absolutely right, John Hancock. <laughs> We're off to a good start with $50. You have $50 that nobody can take away from you except the Revenue Department. Now, what is the next one you want to try? We'll try the seventh question. Seventy dollars. Who was the general in charge of the government forces annihilated in the Battle of the Little Big Horn? General George Custer. That is absolutely right. 
You now have one hundred twenty dollars. What take is the one you're going to try now? We'll take uh, eight. Eighty. William H. Seward, as Secretary of State, was responsible for a land purchase that was known as Seward's Folly. What was Seward's Folly? He purchased some land for the United States. He was Secretary of State. And if you don't know, guess. Louisiana? No. I'm sorry, it's Alaska. But they still have $120. You have $120 that nobody can take away from you. Now, which one do you want to try for on your final question? I'll try the tenth question. The hundred dollar question? Yeah. Who was the first man to become president of all the forty eight states? George Washington. The forty eight states. Oh, the forty eight states. Think it over for a minute. Not the thirteen, but the forty eight. Calvin Coolidge. No, it's William Howard Taft. Or if you want to be really technical. I would have accepted Eisenhower as the answer, since Ohio was formally admitted to the Union in 1953. So anyway, they, they want... wind up with $120. And well, thanks and good luck from the DeSoto Plymouth dealers, and I'm sorry you didn't win more. All right, George, who's next? Groucho, we ask for volunteers tonight. Uh, people... For the Army? No, no, people with interesting stories. We asked that type of person to volunteer. Oh, I see. And uh, just before we went on the air, uh, a Roxy Jam Gogian and Walter Atkinson were chosen to be on the show. And here they are. So, folks, would you come in, please, and meet Groucho Marx. Welcome for the DeSoto Plymouth dealer. Say the secret word, and you'll divide $100. It's a common word, something you see every day. A Roxy Jam Gogian. Uh, who's there? That's uh, me, Groucho. That's you? Huh? Yeah. How far did I miss the pronunciation? Well, not any farther than the average person. Oh. <laughs> what kind of a name is uh, Yam y- Yamogchian? Shamgochian. Shamgochian? Yes. What, uh, it's what? an Armenian name. Armenian, huh? Well, what should I call you? Uh, um, a Raxi? My friends call me Roxy, which is much easier to say. Oh, don't, don't, say, don't mention Roxy, will you? No. I played the Roxy in New York. We did five performances a day, and each performance lasted an hour. And on Saturday and Sunday, we did six. So if you must have a nickname, I'll call you the Palace or the Majestic Theater in Chicago. (laughs) Do you have a job? Yes, I do. I teach at the Fairfax High School. Oh, really? In fact, I've been there since the school opened. What do you you teach? Well, until just recently, I taught um, drama and public speaking, had the play production work. But just now, I'm in the English department. Oh, you teach English? That's right. And where are you from, Walt? I'm from Madison, Georgia. That's close to Athens. (laughs) I thought Athens was in Greece. Is that still your home, uh, Uh, Georgia? No, I was... When when I left, when I was ten years old, we went south. You went south? (laughs) You went south from Georgia? Yes, we went to Florida. Oh. I thought the only thing south of Georgia was the uh, Africa, uh, South Pole. No, we went we went south. The bow evil and the zuzu bugs got too rough, and we went south. But, I mean, they drove us plumb out of Georgia. What do you mean by plumb out? You had no plums? <laughs> no, we, we loaded up in a truck and headed south for Florida. And then when we got it... You went by Bull Weevil to Florida? No, the Bull Weevil drove us out. The Bull Weevil and the Zuzu bugs. Oh. <laughs> I thought Zuzu was a ginger snapper. The Zuzu bug is quite a bug. It is? <laughs> well, uh, evidently. What is it? Could you describe a Zuzu bug for us? Uh, you know anything about cotton? I know Joe Cotton. I've they, seen the the movies. The Zuzu bugs, they suck the blossom, sting the bowl... Pull up the stalk and cover up the hole. <laughs> well, I don't blame you for scrambling out of there. <laughs> so where'd, where'd you wind up? We 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 landed in Umatilla. Well, That's between Aspatula and Okehunky. <laughs> Well, where else could it be? <laughs> what was the name of this river? The Octawaha. Oh. 
Well, why did your family decide to settle in uh, Omatilla? Well, did they know anybody Umatilla, there? Umatilla, they... Well, we, when we were, we, as we were passing through Umatilla on this truck, a rear tire blew out. And we kind of settled out there. <laughs> well, you'd have settled any place where the tire blew out, is that it? Well, in this case, that's a, that we settled in Umatilla. Uh-huh. I don't think I'm familiar with Umatilla. I, I haven't been there recently. Uh, where is it located? Yeah, but tell her, I told you, it's, it's, on, it's between Astatool and Oakie Hunky. Thanks to Arthur Warhol. Well, he hasn't changed the story any. Has he? <laughs> what kind of a joint is Uma Tiller? Is, uh, is, is it anything like New York City? No smoke, no small. Lots of rain and very little fog. Apex of the Golden Triangle, the home of the Okefenokee Queen Watermelon and the Big Mouth Bass. The heart of nature's wonderland. Yuma Tiller, you'll like it. <laughs> three uh, three filling stations and all all car garage, a post office and a barber shop. Wait a minute, you said something. You said car. Okay, up. Uh. You said the secret word car, so you get $50, and uh, Mrs. McGotchen uh, gets uh, $50. Uh, what did I say? You said... <laughs> you said bull weevil, and that's the secret word. In there. <laughs> just, you just happened to be lucky that bull weevil was the secret word. It wouldn't happen again in a hundred years. Huh? <laughs> it was either bull weevil or Uma Tiller. I don't remember. <laughs> well, it's certainly been a confusing experience talking to you two. But now it's time to play your bet your life. You know how to play our new quiz? I have a yes. list of ten yes. questions. You pick the category yourself. Is that right? Yes, sir. In the race for the $1,500, the first couple lead with $260. Let's see how much money you can make. You select a dictionary quiz. And being from Fairfax High, you ought to be very good at this, Mrs. Uh, Yamagochian. Now, uh, which question do you want to choose first? You can start with ten or a hundred or fifty? Let's start with four. You don't want to discuss this with her at all? Yes, uh, question number four, that's number forty dollars? Oh, yes. All right. A man who grinds grains and makes flour is called what? Talk it over. A miller. A miller on the D, that's right. Now I have forty dollars. Now what do you want to do? Five. Number fifty, huh? If you were indolent, what would you be? Lazy. You'd be lazy. That's right. <laughs> We now have $90. Which one? Well, eight. Shall we try eight? $80? $80. If an aviary is a place to keep birds, what is an apiary? A-P-I-A-R-Y. Apiary? Apiary. Apiary. Bees. That's right. The place to keep bees. We now have $170. Now, which question do you want to try for? The 90, 100, 60... 30? 60. 60. What is the Latin phrase that means solid earth? Terra fun. Yes, he knew that. <laughs> and you wind up with $230. Thanks and good luck from the DeSoto Plymouth dealers. <laughs> and that means the bridge teacher and the song plugger with $260. In just one minute, get the chance of the DeSoto Plymouth $1,500 question, Groucho. Hello, this is Arlene Francis, here to tell you about the 1954 DeSoto Automatic. This dramatic new 1954 DeSoto is called the Automatic because it's the one car designed and built to carry out your sudden orders instantly, silently, and safely at all speeds. Parking or steering, DeSoto Full Power Steering works for you all the time and does the work of turning the wheel for you. And this year, the DeSoto Automatic offers you Power Flight Transmission. With Power Flight Drive, you have really astonishing getaway power, and you never even lift your foot from the pedal. 
More big news is that the mighty DeSoto Fire Dome V8 engine is now a full 170 horsepower. Take it from me, you'll want to see this 1954 DeSoto automatic right away at your DeSoto Plymouth dealers. Now here's the bridge teacher and the song plugger all set for the DeSoto Plymouth $1,500 question. In 1889, an American newspaper woman went around the world in 72 days, 6 hours, and 11 minutes. For $1,500, what was the name of this famous New York journalist? Talk it over. What is the answer you two have decided upon? It wasn't Francis Quimby, was it? No, it was Nellie Bly, a very famous name. Oh, yes. I'm so that means the big question next week will be worth $2,000. Well, they lost the big money, but how much did they win the quiz, George? They won $260 well, in the quiz. Well, not so bad. Congratulations, and thanks to both of you and to all of our contestants on the show much. tonight. Thank you very much. God you bet your life. Thank you. Be sure to tune in again next Wednesday night at the same time for the Groucho Marx Show, when the big question will be worth $2,000. And don't miss Groucho's television show, also presented by the DeSoto Plymouth Dealers of America. And remember that the dealers who sell the outstanding 1954 DeSoto Automatic with fully automatic power flight transmission also have on display the remarkable new Plymouth, engineered and built to be your best buy in the low-priced field. DeSoto... Plymouth, two great new cars, both products of the Chrysler Corporation. And when you drive in, tell them Groucho sent you. Good night, folks, and remember, just be sure to see the DeSoto Automatic. (laughs) Folks, here's a reminder from the National Safety Council. Good drivers drive safe cars. So wise up, check up, fix up. You Bet Your Life, transcribed from Hollywood, is produced by John Goodell. Directed by Robert Dwan and Bernie Smith. This is George Fenneman signing off for the more than 3,000 DeSoto Plymouth dealers from coast to coast. You Bet Your Life is heard by our armed forces throughout the world. (laughs) 